right, thank you for having me. Um, I have no financial disclosures. And diving into the topic, giant cell arteritis, um, uh, you may know that it is a well-known auto-inflammatory syndrome, and some argue that it is the only neuroophthalmic emergency. Um, so you must recognize giant cell arteritis because the disease can quickly progress to irreversible vision loss and um, also some neurologic consequences such as stroke. So that the underlying vasculitis is recognized. Um, the vision loss can be irreversible, uh, or can be reversible, um, and then you can also prevent the fellow eye from being affected. One comment about nomenclature is that I originally named this talk temporal arteritis, um, but in the rheumatology world it has lost popularity um, because not every patient with giant cell arteritis has a temporal artery involved. And sometimes the temporal artery can be involved, but it's not giant cell arteritis. It could be something else like a Wegener's vasculitis. Our goals today are to review the basics of giant cell arteritis and in that vein to understand the basics of the vasculitis in the large and the medium arteries. Because I'm a neuro-ophthalmologist, we'll review the ophthalmologic presentations of giant cell arteritis. And then finally, we'll dive into some of the past therapies, the present therapies, and then some exciting future therapies for the treatment of the vasculitis and giant cell arteritis. So Dr. May gave me this case, and I want you to present, pretend that you're, you are the neurohospitalist or hospitalist on this case. So you have an 81-year-old man presenting to you with hyperlipidemia, though he doesn't take statins because of intolerance. About a year ago, he woke up with this transient event of speaking gibberish, and then it resolved. And then a month ago, he had more of these spells. He had multiple episodes of waking up with strange abnormal speech. And then his wife witnessed stiffening for a brief 30 seconds. Because there were a handful of these spells in the last month, he was placed on um, levetiracetam and was seen in the epilepsy uh, department. And they agreed with him being on this medication. Then two weeks ago, um, he had multiple events of these floating positive visual phenomena with seeing kaleidoscopes on the left field. This was presumed to be maybe related to ocular migraine. And then one day prior to presentation, uh, he developed this central scotoma in the left eye. So in the middle of his visual field in the left eye, he was missing vision. And then the morning of presentation, he has complete loss of vision in the left eye or near complete loss of vision. He appropriately sees ophthalmology who, diagnoses him, who diagnosed him with a central retinal artery occlusion of the left eye with sparing of um, the distribution of the ciliaretinal artery. At that point, his vision was hand motion in the left eye. So this is a representative fundus photo. Uh, what you would appreciate would, would be pallor of the retina um, with some areas of, of sparing um, in, in this uh, region between the nerve and the macula. Uh, so he was sent to be admitted um, and when you talk to him, he tells you that he does not have many of the symptoms of giant cell arteritis, um, no jaw claudication, headache, weight loss, or myalgias. On examination, he has hand motion vision in the left eye. Um, there's some patchy areas where they're sparing of vision, but mostly centrally it's um, hand motion. And he has a large relative, rel large relative afferent pupillary defect on the left eye. Some of his data includes an ESR of 8, um, a CRP of 1.6. I've given you the reference range. His CBC was normal, including platelets that were normal. And then things happen fast um, in the hospital. He gets a carotid Doppler, which showed um, in the left, on the left side, a 50 to 69% <coughs> reduction in the carotid bulb with irregular plaque. And then the follow-up study was emboli monitoring, which was negative. So this is where you think about what you would do next. Number one, this is for sure giant cell arteritis. Um, let's start steroids and get a temporal artery biopsy now. 
Um, number two is to obtain better or more imaging, um, not necessarily better. Um, CTA head and neck. Uh, number three is get a Doppler of the temporal arteries. And then number four, all of the above. Let's think about what you may do. So then, then the next thing that happened was that he got a CTA of the head and neck. Intracranially, he had atherosclerosis. Extracranially, um, this was significant for 50% stenosis at the origin of the IC on the right side. And on the left, you can see here that he has severe calcification and high-grade stenosis of the common carotid bulb at 70 to 80%. So again, uh, what would you do, do next? This is for sure giant cell arteritis. Um, number two, contact our vascular neurosurgeons. Uh, number three, obtain a Doppler of the temporal arteries. And then number four, send him home. So vascular neurosurgery was consulted, and um, the plan was to have him potentially get a stent um, in the following week. And uh, thus, he was discharged with a new medication called um, Plavix, or Clopidogrel. And he was, so he was already on aspirin, so he was given a new medication. Uh, so two days later, he comes back uh, to the ER, and he says that he has lattice, like, like a web, vision in the other eye, so the right eye. Um, and because he already had plans with neurosurgery, he was overnight directly um, admitted to the neurosurgery service in preparation for an expedited um, placement of this stent, and he was loaded um, with antiplatelets. Um, neurology and ophthalmology were consulted. Um, the ophthalmologist grilled him more on his giant cell arteritis symptoms and kind of came out and said that you know, when he was chewing, he did get some numbness in his jaw, not necessarily pain. Um, and then retrospectively, maybe he was having some headaches. And then he also, this remote history of PMR did surface as well. So steroids were initiated. And uh, soon after that, he said that his vision in the right eye normalized. Um, and so the temporal artery biopsy was requested. And since he was already on the neurosurgery service, he had um, the temporal artery biopsy done the next day. Um, and then a few days later, he also had balloon angioplasty of the left internal carotid artery um, with placement of a stent. And the um, conventional angiogram showed left ICA stenosis estimated at 82%. He also had flow limiting stenosis of his left vertebral artery. The final diagnosis of the right temporal artery um, showed focal inflammation, and fragmentation of the elastic lamina, and that's consistent with the diagnosis of temporal arteritis. So he's following with Dr. May, and we can ask him how this patient is doing later on. So um, in terms of giant cell arteritis, um, it is, this is probably the most ancient description, maybe, of the disease. Uh, this rheumatology journal found an Egyptian piece of artwork um, that described a man that was more cachectic looking with abnormal scalp appearance. But other than that, there's little description of this disease um, further back than 100 years. It's only been well described in about the last 100 years. So there's a couple reasons for that, maybe. One is that we have an older population now, um, since it's a, and because this is a disease in el more elderly people, um, could be that people didn't live as long back in the day, and it was not described. Um, the other possibility is that there has been a new trigger environmentally in the last year that has brought about um, this type of vasculitis. As I said, it's only been described in the literature clear clearly for the last 100 to 150 years. The first guy to describe it was a, a man named, a uh, physician named um, Hutchinson, and he described an elderly man who had red streaks on his scalp. And they were like these cords um, that were very painful. He was not able to wear a hat. And over time, the, the streaks seemed to kind of thrombose and harden and lose their pulse, pulses. 
he presumed that this man had arterial sclerosis and called it thrombotic arteritis of the aged later on a guy named dr horton at mayo clinic described at the weekly mayo clinic conference two of his patients that had similar symptoms it was a man and a woman they were both in their eighties and they had symptoms constitutional symptoms of fever myalgias and jaw stiffness and then he biopsied their temporal arteries and both of the biopsies looked very similar uh, so he presented these findings to his colleagues who also found this to be really interesting uh, what they did was they ground up the biopsy um, results uh, or specimen and they injected the specimen into five healthy volunteers and into their scalp and none of them developed similar symptoms so that wasn't enough and they um, had leftover biopsy tissue and injected it into the vein of a healthy 64 year old woman and interestingly she developed fever anemia elevated ESR for a couple months um, it's not clear what they concluded, but I think they concluded that it, this could potentially be an autoimmune process. Other authors wanted to name this disease Horton's disease because he was the original one to describe it in more detail. What has stuck around is giant cell arteritis. Um, and there's some flaws to that name as well because not every patient with giant cell arteritis has the pathognomon, has has the giant cells um, in the, the pathology. As you may know, giant cell arteritis um, likes to involve the large and the medium-sized vessels. And the most commonly um, involved vessels are the vertebral artery, the ophthalmic artery, the posterior ciliary artery, and the superficial temporal artery. So I like to memorize it as VOPS, V-O-P-S. It's not what's not depicted here is the vertebral artery, and what's not depicted here is the posterior ciliary artery. Um, you may know what the vertebral, ophthalmic, and superficial temporal arteries are, but what, exact, what exactly and where is the posterior ciliary artery? And why is it important? Um, so the major branches of the ophthalmic artery, um, one of the major ones is the central retinal artery. This pierces the dura and goes through the optic nerve, past the optic disc, um, and it supplies the retina. It branches into the superior and inferior arcades and supplies the retina. Another branch of the ophthalmic artery or branches are the posterior ciliary arteries. And they are initially extradural, and their ultimate goal is to supply the optic disc or the anterior <laughs> optic nerve. And this is just another angle of the vascular supply of the eye. Um, again, this is the central retinal artery, uh, one of the branches of the ophthalmic artery. It goes through the optic disc, but goes on to supply the retina. And the disc, or the anterior part of the optic nerve, is supplied by the branch by uh, posterior ciliary artery. And so by definition, if there is ischemia, to the front of the optic nerve, it is due to um, ischemia in the vessels, in the posterior ciliary, in the posterior ciliary artery vessels, and also by definition, ischemia to the optic disc involves swelling of the optic disc um, in the initial time period. This slide gets a little bit confusing, so we can always go back and look at it. Um, when we talk about ischemic optic neuropathy, it's categorized as anterior or posterior. Um, and then with anterior, it can be further, further categorized from an ischemic standpoint as non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy or arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And again, initially, um, there should be disc swelling. Uh, we see non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy every day in the clinics. Um, whereas the arteritic form, which is the G, usually f related to GCA, is less common. Now jumping over to posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, there also is a non-arteritic form, and then there's the arteritic form from something like giant cell arteritis. 
common causes of non-arteritic posterior ischemic optic neuropathy um, have to do with a watershed injury, um, sometimes due to prolonged cardiac surgery or um, having a prolonged um, spine surgery with the patient, usually in the prone position. It's pretty rare. Um, so I would have to say that one of the most common things that we see is the non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Yes, we do think about whether or not it's arteritic when the patient is being evaluated. Um, so I want to make a little segue for non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, it is a painless vision loss, and it also happens in older adults with some vascular risk factors. But a separate risk factor is having a crowded appearing optic nerve on the other side, where the cup to disc ratio is small. There's some correlation with nocturnal hypotension and obstructive sleep apnea. It can happen um, in the fellow eye because it's designed similarly, um, but it rarely happens again in the same eye. So there's always that debate in an elderly patient whether it's non-arteritic or arteritic. And very commonly, even if it looks classically non-arteritic, patients will come already with an ESR and CRP because ophthalmologists are thinking about the arteritic form. From an exam point of view, there is no definite rule of thumb. Um, there are features that help point you one way or the other. I would have to say that with non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, that some of the more classic visual field findings are, um, well, one of the classic visual field findings is having an altitudinal defect. Um, so a defect that is either superior or inferior in the eye affected, and it often very nicely respects the horizontal meridian. And sometimes visual acuity can be quite good because it may spare um, central vision. With arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, it can look like this too, but the vision loss could be worse. The vision, visual field could be more confluently affected. Another feature with the arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy form um, is that the optic nerve may look more pale. Um, so subjectively, it looks more chalky and pallid. And that's a feature that we use to help lean more towards an arteritic um, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Also in the arteritic forms, you may see other things going on in the fundus. You may see cotton wool spots or other areas of ischemia. Uh, but there is not a classic visual field finding or even, even a swollen nerve doesn't necessarily definitively point you one way or the other. It has to be the whole picture. Uh, so I just want to reiterate that the vasculitis in giant cell arteritis involves the large and the medium-sized arteries. And it is the large and medium-sized arteries that have elastin or elastic lamina. So I want you to take some time to look at this picture. It's a little bit confusing, but it is meant to point you towards which vessels are most involved in this vasculitis. The black vessels are most commonly involved, the grayed out vessels medium involved, and the white vessels the least, uh, less commonly involved. I don't know if you see a pattern. Um, the pattern that this is trying to portray is that there's a preference for the extradural vessels. And once the dura pierce, once the vessel pierces the dura, it loses that risk for vasculitis. So we have those common arteries that I talked about, the superficial temporal artery the vertebral artery, the ophthalmic artery, and the posterior ciliary arteries, branches of the ophthalmic artery. And you can see that the posterior ciliary, ciliary, ciliary artery has um, severe uh, risk or involvement for vasculitis. Central retinal artery is also involved, but it, it does lose some risk once it pierces the dura. Because the posterior ciliary is at high risk for involvement of giant cell arteritis, is the most common presentation of vision loss in giant cell arteritis by far. Um, so the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is by far the most common presentation. Uh, so again, why are the intracranial arteries less 
involved why is it that when it pierces a dura it loses some of this risk um, and so remember that I said that the intracranial arteries have less elastin so the elastin makes a difference um, this is an elastin and eosin stain and all the dark fibers are elastin you can see in the tunica adventitia and the tunica media it's filled with these elastin fibers and then there is an elastic lamina as well. Um, and there's a reduction in the amount of elastic fibers as you pierce the dura. Um, so there's a correlation between the severity and the extent of the arteritic process and the amount of elastic tissue. There's another artery that I haven't really gone into. And I debated whether or not we should talk about it. But the reason why I want to talk about it um, is because if this artery is involved, there can be more deadly consequences, and that's the aorta. So symptomatic aortic involvement is rare. Um, so ways that the aorta can be involved in giant cell arteritis are aorta, aortic thickening, aortic insufficiency, aneurysm, and then more, um, more deadly would be dissection or rupture. Um, hypertension is also a risk factor for aneurysm in these patients. Um, again, minor aortic disease can happen with just kind of circumferential thickening, uh, but it's often asymptomatic. So when you do check, up to 80% of patients with giant cell arteritis at some point may have this thickening. Um, but the good thing is that the aortitis can, involve, can resolve with steroids. And it has been known that complications of the aorta can occur many months after the diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. So if a patient presents with chest pain um, with a recent diagnosis of giant cell arteritis, uh, just beware that this is a potential outcome. This is a case of a, an elderly woman who was diagnosed with giant cell arteritis and was on steroids for three months and then uh, developed chest pain coma and death, um, and her presentation involved um, dissection of the aor aorta. It's unclear what the screening protocol should be um, when I ask rheumatology. Um, there are no strict guidelines on what to do, but I have seen um, some rheumatologists do a screening CT or chest x-ray, abdominal ultrasound, echo. Some of them do it yearly. Uh, we talked about why the size of the artery matters and why elastin matters. But another thing that matters is age. Um, so the incidence peaks between 70 to 80 years of age, and by far it's the strongest risk factor for somebody to have giant cell arteritis. And, and the number of people at risk in developed countries is expected to double in the next 25 years. Um, there's a predilection for Caucasian ethnicity, so as you go to northern latitude, um, there's higher risk. Uh, women are also multiple times more at risk than men. And then there's a genetic risk with HLA-DR4 haplotype. Um, in this investigation of Olmsted County, um, uh, in addition to an increase in incidence rates of giant cell arteritis over the study period, there's this cyclical pattern every five to seven years. And this suggests that there may be some environmental contribution, perhaps some type of infection. And so many infections have been proposed, just to name a few, parvovirus, parainfluenza, EBV, RSV, chlamydia, pneumonia, mycoplasma, pneumonia, they've all been written about in the literature. Not one has stood out. Um, let's take a jab at the etiology, knowing that there is this environmental trigger um, the theory is that um, a virus or an unidentified antigen triggers inflammation of the arterial wall. So the dendrites are triggered by an antigen. Um, these dendrites live um, in the uh, tunica adventitia. And when they're triggered, they multiply, and then they use cytokines to call upon other inflammatory cells. And when they arrive, it causes hyperplasia of the uh, vascular smooth muscle cells, and that causes um, occlusion, ultimately, um, of the intima in the vessel. So when you think about occlusion of the vessel, you want to think about what kinds of symptoms could arise. 
common symptoms are new headache, jaw claudication. Uh, you can also have tongue pain from ischemia of the tongue as well. And then the common constitutional symptoms are fatigue, fever, malaise, weight loss, and then, then PMR symptoms can occur 50% of the time. There are other high yield questions that have in this study high likelihood ratios and support of temporal arteritis. These include, well, jaw claudication is a big one, and then diplopia. I'm not sure how that gets, um, uh, I'm not sure why, because I don't know what vessel exactly that is. It's not really a medium or large vessel, but it seemed to have a very high uh, likelihood ratio in the study for supporting temporal arteritis. And then the exam findings, if you ever see a beaded temporal artery, prominent or enlarged temporal artery, tender temporal artery, or absent temporal artery pulse, um, those are high yield exam findings that would be supportive of temporal arteritis. Um, and then from a laboratory standpoint, an ESR of greater than 50 or greater than 100 um, would be setting you up for having a higher risk for temporal arteritis. The problem with ESR um, it, is not, it is not a perfect test. The cutoff is 50 for normal, and then um, technically for men, it's age divided by two is the upper limit of normal, and then with women, it's age plus 10 divided by two is upper limit of normal. The scary thing is that 5% of biopsy-proven giant cell arteritis patients can have a negative ESR. CRP is more sensitive, and then IL-6 is the most sensitive. We do not routinely use IL-6 um, as a marker in the United States. I think it is used in Europe and in clinical studies, um, but I have not seen it be, be routinely used um, to monitor or diagnose giant cell arteritis. Uh, this brings me to the 1990 American College of Rheumatology criteria, and interestingly, you do not have to have a high ESR to have giant cell arteritis. Um, in their criteria, you need to have three of these five things um, to meet the criteria for having giant cell arteritis. And if you meet three of the five, there's a sensitivity of 93% and a specificity of 91.2% for giant cell arteritis. So these include age of disease, onset greater than 50 years, a new headache, temporal artery abnormality, where there's temporal artery tenderness unrelated to arteriosclerosis, an elevated ESR greater than 50, or an abnormal artery biopsy. So if you have three or more, this would point you towards increased likelihood of the patient having giant cell arteritis. Another way to find out if a patient has a vasculitic process or a giant cell arteritis pro process is to do a fluorescein angiogram. Um, so this is a study where fluorescein dye is injected into the vein, and um, there are continual pictures taken of the fundus over um, a timed period. Um, so there's a normal time for the fluorescein to get to the eye. Um, and in patients with giant cell arteritis, there is usually abnormal choroid filling. So the choroid is the rich vascular layer between the retina and the sclera. It's very much supplied by the posterior ciliary arteries. Um, and what we found is that in patients with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, you're confused about whether it's arteritic or non-arteritic. This could be a tool to help point you towards it being more arteritic. And that's if there's the filling is abnormal. And you can see that it's uh, there's a demarcation here of abnormal choroidal filling. Um, what's interesting is that you can also see this in the unaffected eye of somebody with giant cell arteritis. Another tool that you may or may not want to use is the color Doppler ultrasound of the temporal arteries. I don't see any vascular text here. Um, so this was first described by Smith at all in 1995, he described a halo sign. It's a hypoechogenicity around the vessel. And this represents increased vascular permeability from inflammation from vasculitis. And in his initial study, the sensitivity 
for giant cell arteritis was 76% with a specificity of 92%. There have been many, many follow-up studies since then. And the overall meta-analysis is that the sensitivity is still about 73% with a specificity between 80 to 90%. So it is also not a perfect test. Um, there are many advantages, as you can imagine. It's less invasive. You potentially don't have to call upon a vascular surgeon. Um, a positive result is very helpful because, as you remember, the specificity was a little bit higher. It could potentially help you decide which side to biopsy. And I think that it's useful if you either have a pretty high pretest likelihood or you have a pretty low one, and this test would just kind of confirm and make you feel better about where you stand. Um, but there are definite disadvantages in that, based on all the studies that were done, um, the results in sensitivity and specificity are kind of all over the place. And thus, it is highly examiner dependent and institution dependent. And when you look at the studies, they still use temporal artery biopsy as the gold standard. So I did talk to Merrill, one of our vascular, vascular technicians, briefly. And she told me she really couldn't remember the last time that she did one. She has done one before. Um, and she's not sure if we have the right probe right now. Um, so the verdict is that I'm still not sure if it's a great study at Swedish. We can look into it more. Um, I think it's nice to know maybe which side to do. Um, and so it could be potentially helpful. So we talked about the gold standard, and that's the temporal artery biopsy. The specificity is 100%, near 100%, um, with a sensitivity around 87%. Um, and the reason why that's not perfect is that is because you can skip the actual lesion um, and get maybe a normal sec segment and miss the abnormality. I've been asked this question before, and that is, should we do both sides? Um, my answer is that based on the literature, there's no evidence that doing both at once is going to give you a higher yield. Um, and so what you're going to find in the pathology results um, for a positive biopsy would be inflammation at the transition zone between the tunica adventitia and the tunica media with broken up elastic lamina um, and the rallying of inflammation cells such as lymphocytes, macrophages, and giant cells. Um, and giant cells aren't always seen. And this is a classic um, pathology result. The arrows depict the giant cells um, which are present in 50% of the um, slide, slide samples. Um, and there's also this broken up smooth muscle layer and then hyperplasia with near occlusion of the intima. So once you've made the diagnosis of giant cell arteritis, actually before the biopsy comes back, if your suspicion is that your patient has giant cell arteritis, you would start them on steroids either a high-dose IV or oral steroids. I would favor IV steroids at three to five days a gram a day um, if there is vision loss already. After that initial high-dose steroid bolus, um, the patient would get long-term oral therapy. And this is after you've confirmed the diagnosis. Um, the long-term therapy would start at one mg per keg per day for about a month. Um, and then a slow taper between 6 to 12 months. Prednisone. Yeah, although I think other things can be used, too. It's just that's what um, I use and what a lot of the rheumatologists use as well. Um, I can't say that other um, formulations of steroids cannot be used. Um, th there's debate whether or not you should do IV or oral up front. Um, I just prefer to use IV if I have the ability to, if there's vision loss. Uh, the visual prognosis is uh, a wide range. Um, there is a potential for visual recovery. Obviously, if the tissue is already infarcted, um, it'd be hard to extrapolate that you could get a lot of it back. Um, and so there's usually minimally reco minimal recovery when you get to the point of no light perception vision. There's a lot of problems with steroids. 
Um, as you can imagine, in this elderly population, um, the side effects can be very significant. And 90% of patients will suffer some type of side effect within the 10 years of treatment. Common side effects include exacerbation of diabetes, osteoporosis and fracture, infection, uh, GI bleed, increased blood pressure. Uh, this is a case that I encountered with a gentleman who was 80 um, and had recurrent giant cell arteritis relapses. His initial presentation was anterior ischemic optic neuropathy to the point of hand motion vision. Every time he went below 20 milligrams, he became symptomatic mostly with temple pain. In the long term, he developed severe osteoporosis of the spine with compression fractures. He also had hospital admissions for pneumonia. Not sure if that's related solely to the steroids. Uh, more recently, I had a, I saw a patient um, who had nonspecific vision complaints and new chronic headache. Um, she was placed on steroids. Uh, oh, and her ESR was actually normal, but she was placed on steroids and then waited for the temporal artery biopsy. It took about two to three weeks. She got it done, and it was negative. Um, but in the time span that she was on steroids for those two to three weeks, her underlying cataracts got worse. Um, and retrospectively, you wonder if the vision symptoms could have originally have been from cataracts. Um, so, I mean, the cataracts got worse, and all in all, it's not a severe side effect, uh, but it's just another thing that can happen with steroids. So the holy grail is really to find a steroid-sparing agent, and in order to find the holy grail, you really have to understand the immune system. Again, um, in a normal immune system, there are dendritic cells hiding in the adventitia of our large and medium-sized arteries. And when this environmental trigger, whatever it may be, happens, the dendrites multiply and they call upon CD4 T cells, which come through the vasa vasorum. So you really have to be a big enough vessel to have a vasa vasorum. Um, so they come in and they subspecialize to Th1 and Th17 cells. And then over time, this stimulates hyperplasia of the vascular smooth muscle cells and ultimately um, occlusion of the blood vessel. Steroid sparing agents of the past have included, and the present, include methotrexate. I see this used a lot. And I gave it a plus minus because for every positive study out there, there's a negative study. Um, and despite this, I see a lot of patients on it who have recurrence of giant cell arteritis. Uh, secondly, there's the TNF-alpha inhibitors. There are a lot of case reports of patients with relapse on steroids who received TNF-alpha inhibitor um, and then was able to get off steroids and uh, be rid of the disease. But when we went and when, when they went and did a randomized study, it actually was proven to be ineffective. Uh, there's a question of antibiotics. Um, in my time at the University of Utah, there was a lot of buzz about a certain bacterial strain called Burkholderia. It's a ubiquitous um, bacteria um, where the molecular lab there found DNA of this bacteria in the artery walls of giant cell arteries patients, and they could not find it in the corresponding control patients. Um, and then they went one step further and tested this the sera of patients with giant cell arteritis um, for the lipopolysaccharide of the bacteria. And they found that the patients with giant cell arteritis had a much higher serum concentration of the lipopolysaccharide compared to controls and patients with treated giant cell arteritis or patients with other types of arteritis. Um, they also had a mouse model um, that was injected with this bacteria and this created a vasculitis, and they found that um, the mice that had steroids and antibiotics did better than the mice that had steroids alone. Um, unfortunately, this study was never replicated. Um, there are some that will add on minocycline as adjunct um, in patients that have recurrent giant cell arteries that require steroids for a very long time. And then the newest entity is the IL-6 inhibitors. 
so as you remember in my last slide the dendrites use cytokines to call upon the CD4 cells that then subspecialized to the TH17 cells, and then these further release cytokines that call upon all types of inflammatory cells. So IL-6 is one of the cytokines that get things going. And um, if the goal was to find IL-6 inhibition and see if that could dampen the inflammatory response. So tocilizumab does that. It is an IL-6 inhibitor. It is a humanized monoclonal anti-IL-6 receptor antibody, and it inhibits IL-6 signal production. It is currently approved for rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So this, uh, this drug was used um, in a study for giant cell arteritis in Switzerland last year. And this is published. Um, they, did, they did a single center randomized placebo controlled phase two trial using tocilizumab as an add on therapy to steroids. So, this is a single center study where they only had about 30 patients. The primary outcome endpoint was no relapse at 52 weeks. And this was a positive result. The patients that got tocilizumab and Steroid. So the, there were two arms. There was a tocilizumab and steroid arm and the placebo and steroid arm. And at 52 weeks, the no relapse rate was 85% in the, the tocilizumab group and 20% in the placebo group. And that was statistically significant. So based on these results, there was a um, phase three multicenter study that was done and closed in September. The study enrolled 251 patients. It was a multi-center study, um, primarily in Europe. And they got their support from Roche and Genentech. Uh, Roche is a parent company to Genentech. And the um, study name is called GATCA. I don't exactly know what it means. Um, but it is yet to be published. So the posters were presented at the American College of Rheumatology in January, and then it was again presented at the Neuro-Ophthalmology Neuro Society meeting recently. Um, so there were four arms to that study. The first arm was uh, giant cell arteritis patients receive steroids for six months, taper, or steroids for 12 months. The treatment arms with tocilizumab were every other week subcutaneous tocilizumab with steroids over six months or every other week. So one was every week and one was every other week, which is a lower dose. Um, tocilizumab with steroids over six months. And the primary endpoint was no relapse at 12 months. And the patients in the arms receiving tocilizumab had less, uh, had, had more uh, higher no relapse rate at 56% and 53% compared to the patients that did not get tocilizumab, and that was statistically significant. Regarding side effects, uh, they found that the patients that received steroids alone had more side effects, presumably from steroid side effects. In fact, these patients ended up receiving more steroids because of their relapses and received almost or more than twice the amount of the patients that got tocilizumab. Regarding the side effects of tocilizumab alone, um, the major side effects were neutropenia, as expected, and nasopharyngitis. Uh, so this is really exciting information. It's exciting for the rheumatologists and the neuro-ophthalmologists, and should be exciting to you as well. Uh, recently, tocilizumab um, received priority review by the FDA for treatment of giant cell arteritis. So it has not been FDA approved. It is on the fast track, and so we'll be hearing soon hopefully. One of the questions is how costly will this drug be? Uh, the estimates in Europe are between ten dollars to $20,000 per year. Um, and some of the experience in Europe has been that patients have been on it for a year and actually could get off of the drug after a year. Um, this potentially would be more cost effective than getting um, like a hip replacement from a fracture from the hip. Um, but we shall see. Currently, if you want your patient to get an IL-6 inhibitor, you would have to 
and talk to the insurance company about funding for it. Um, I am aware that there's a study going on at Virginia Mason with a different IL-6 inhibitor. I mean, I have that contact information if you are at all interested. So I wanted to end on a good note and um, just review some of the take-home points. We talked about age being very important and elastin being important. The major vessels are <laughs> vertebral, ophthalmic, posterior ciliary artery, superficial temporal artery. I put a parenthesis around aorta because even though it is less commonly symptomatically affected, um, it's important to know about because complications could be um, severe. I would get a good history. I have to admit that that patient that Dr. May gave me was somebody that I saw in the hospital, and I fully supported him being discharged from the hospital. Um, so I don't know if I was in a big rush, but I didn't really get those giant cell arteritis symptoms initially. Um, an arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is the most common presentation of the vision loss in giant cell arteritis. For right now, steroids is still the mainstay of therapy, and uh, let's wait and see regarding the FDA approval for IL-6 inhibitors in the treatment of giant cell arteritis. So that's all I have. Any questions?